Dave Douglas is a multifaceted fine horn player who composes in many styles. He started his musical career playing piano when he was five. Today he is a top-notch trumpeter, composer, co-founder, director of the Festival of New Trumpet Music, and artistic director of the workshop in jazz and creative music at Banff Center. It is my pleasure to welcome Dave Douglas to Studio 4 to tell us more. Thank you so much. What a great show. Well, thank you. That was inspiring. Isn't it? Oh. Do you believe all of it or some of it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you we know don't have to go there now. Well, what's so funny about it is how much of that relates to musical work. Mm. You know, everything that you were saying, about we are stardust, we are part of the universe, mm -hmm. comes straight out of creative work that Interesting. artists do. Interesting. Of course it does, do. because when you compose, mm -hmm. now uh, something is in your head, in your brain, mm -hmm. the Dave Douglas brain. Do you hear the music? Does it just flow out of you? Do you write the notes down? make some lines in the treble clef, what do you do? That's a really hard question to answer. Mm. I, I wish I had a patent on the Dave Douglas brain. I think you know, there's, there's something right. in there. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I really think that the sincere search for new music is, is, is it's, it's just as much of a struggle now as it ever was. Okay. You really, you know, if you're a writer of words, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. you really have to go and do that hunt every time sure. and look sincerely at the, the whole uh, structure around what you're doing. And so that goes into a piece like this that I wrote for Turning Point Ensemble. It goes into a jazz piece. It goes mm -hmm. into any sort of writing that I do. Mm -hmm. When you were young, who influenced you musically? Well, you know, influence, it's an interesting question, especially in jazz, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I would have to say, first of all, my father, who played amateur piano, amateur Baroque recorder, and really? amateur banjo folk mm -hmm. music. And, you know, had <laughs> Does a he big know you call him amateur? <laughs> he he would have been the first to admit. He would have been the first to admit that okay. he was an amateur. So you yeah, grew a up proud amateur. with a little music around you, listening on the radio or the or yeah. the uh, and television LPs. LPs. Yeah. To whom? Stevie Wonder, John Stevie Coltrane. Stevie Wonder. I, you know, Satchmo. earliest on, um, my father used to play early jazz mm. for us when mm. we were driving in the car. I would the hear Duke. Coleman Hawkins, Duke Ellington, Fletcher Henderson, Billy Holiday. And I think that um, that was what gave me the improvisation gene, was hearing okay. a singer like Billie Holiday mm -hmm. sing a song differently every time mm -hmm. she sang it, finding mm -hmm. a new way to deliver the words and the sure. sentiment. hence new music. And what does that mean exactly, new music? Whether it be a trumpet, um, uh, uh, an ensemble, an orchestra, a klezmer band, I think people use the word new music in a lot of different ways, mm -hmm. of course, and you know, Vancouver is a very creative city, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm thrilled to be back here. Um, I've had so many wonderful experiences at the Vancouver Jazz Festival, and if you want to talk about new music, um, what they present every summer is in terms music. of, well, in very terms often. of bringing An new people music. that haven't been heard. Mm -hmm. um, I think mu new music, the idea of new music is not hey, I just thought of something that no one else ever played. Mm -hmm. It's more, I discovered some fresh way of expressing this thought that perhaps has been in music for many thousands sure, of years. Sure, which many classical people resist, as you know. How the traditional so? what, what people resist in that mm -hmm. they say, well, that's not how that song goes. <laughs> not all. Well, I failed. But you know what I mean? I failed at classical music because I immediately would start closing my eyes and making up my own version mm -hmm. of what was You would on have the page. failed. You'd have flunked Kreitzer. Oh, I did. Yes, for sure. Not you would. only would I have, but I, I, <laughs> but I did. You and did. I, yeah. And, and I, you know, I think my father maybe was a little bit upset at that, that mm -hmm. I wasn't able to do that. But, sure. you know, it, it was a part of, you know, trying to find my own way and of trying course. to find a new expression of the music. Which takes courage and it takes talent, but it, so you started on piano, went to trombone, mm -hmm. arm not long enough to hit the notes exactly. or what? Exactly. No, you got was it. Was it you, true? Absolutely. Yep. Well, I played in the orchestra for years and I, there was one little guy in the orchestra who loved trombone and he couldn't, he had a little short arm, like an alligator <laughs> arm, and nothing, I mean a normal arm, but he yeah. couldn't like really yeah. do it, so he changed instruments. Well, uh, you know, yes, the arm was too short. I, I was seven. I mean, you know, that's yeah. that's okay. 
but also in the school band, I was sort of quick enough to notice that the trumpet always had the melody and the trombone had this little <laughs> right, less the, important. The pa pa. And so I switched uh, when I was nine. When you were nine. Yeah. And uh, who taught you? First teacher, second teacher. Was there someone who inspired you to uh, pursue the trumpet? You know, I had a great local teacher. I was living in the New York area, Ron Westervelt who I studied with for probably mm, three or four years. Mm. Um, but the technical aspect of this instrument was always difficult for me. And I, you know, I still work really hard to be able to play. Right. Um, but I discovered, I was introduced to a teacher named Carmine Caruso mm. around 1981. Any relation to the other you know Caruso's? What? I don't know, I don't think so. No. But he was okay, already, Caruso. he was a, a brass and woodwind mm. guru in mm. New York. Uh, you know, his technique was the one that, mm, you know, really solidified my own uh, playing, and I still hold by that philosophy. Right, but how difficult is it to play a trumpet? As, uh, say, there's a bassoon, and there's a flute, and there's a fiddle, and there's all of that. There's the strings, and there's the brass, and the woodwinds. So how difficult this? Where do you start uh, on a trumpet? What, <laughs> what little ditty? But don't you play violin, don't I you? I play violin. We do Twinkle Little Star, because it's all okay. open notes. <laughs> right? Yeah. You, you only have to do, like, uh, Mississippi D -D -A -A Hot Talk, right? one one a yeah. Then you go back, and almost anybody can play that who hasn't played the violin. Is that right? Yeah, I can now teach you. you. Yeah, I, now I you make me I can teach you wanna. to play Twinkle Little Star, and that's about it. So what about <laughs> on this? Um, Tell me how you make a note on a trumpet. Okay. I know it's early for you to play, and you don't have to play a tune, but make a note. Like, what's the key? Well, the you breath, know, uh... I, I would say the biggest, the most important thing in, in brass playing is the breath, yes. Mm. Is having a firm, you know, real diaphragm breathing mm -hmm. and uh, all that stuff they talk about in yoga and right. breathing exercises. Very important. Being able to project the air in a, in a clear direction. And then I think, you know, the next step is to realize that all of the pitches you're going to be creating are with your lips, your buzzing. Really? Well, they put all this lip gloss on me right before I came mm -hmm. on the air. So, so you I can't. Might not be, but if that makes sense to you. I know how hard that is because I tried to play the trumpet once or twice. Yeah. And you about blow up if you're well, not, if you don't know how to do the breath thing. You right. get red in the face, and, you're, and right. you do make a note. Not a very pretty note. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm sure in your case it would be fantastic. It was not pretty. It's like blast, <laughs> and you think this is probably not my instrument. Well, it's really, you know, if you just think, like on the piano, it's the string that vibrates. On right. the violin, it's the string and the wood in the instrument. On a saxophone, it's the reed that vibrates. On a trumpet, it's actually your lips that, that create that create mm. the vibration that's transmitted through all the tubes. Okay, of so this when instrument. Quincy Jones plays the horn, yeah, what's why is he so good? The lips, the breath, the the just the combination, the magic. Um, that's he emptied uh, you the know, spit valve. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I heard the, this wonderful interview. Not to quote someone else, but I heard mm -hmm. Anne Sophie Muter, the violinist, yes. speaking. Yes, and someone asked her that question: Why? would two violinists playing the same instrument still sound completely different? Right. And her answer sort of surprised me and, and made me realize a, a truth about playing, that you can only create the sound that already exists in your head. Okay. So what makes Quincy Jones great is that mm -hmm. he has the musical ear inside mm -hmm. so that when he goes to the instrument, he knows what he's looking for and he can transmit it. And he has a passion. I mean, you have auditioned, I'm sure. Did you play in the school band? Did you uh, do I recitals did a lot and of do that. all of that? So you know what yeah. that's like. Yeah. Yeah. And you hear the person ahead of you. Anyway, we did. I don't know if they <laughs> let you do that anymore, but you hear the person ahead of you play the yeah. tune and you think, well, I'm better than that or I'm not that good. And it was uh, the person ahead of you technically could be superb. Mm. But you didn't hear the passion. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think you can hear the passion when someone plays an, uh, an instrument, a Hudi Menowin or, or, or yeah. somebody on yeah. the violin. You know, yeah. the, if you have a Stradivarius and you're not a good violin player, exactly, it, you can't make it sound good, even though it's a right. Strad. Right, so it's the, really the person and the passion. Pretty much. And 
I think, you know, what makes composition so special to me is that it's the moment at which you're forced to sit down mm. and think to yourself, what do I really have to say and how do how I want to say it? So if you went to the five and dime and bought a trumpet mm -hmm. and played a tune on it, and then you played a tune on this one, which I assume is a bit more It's a little money. better than a five and dime, yeah. <laughs> a little yeah. better. Could you make it sound almost the same? Uh, I would do my very best. Mm -hmm. I think it would. I heard Jimmy Pattison, who plays the trumpet, he's a, oh, a mogul, yeah. and he did a demonstration for us once, mm -hmm. uh, uh, one on his beautiful trumpet and one on a little hmm. tin trumpet, and yeah. he made them sound, he was giving us a message, less is more, but yeah. that said, yeah. he made them sound almost the same. Yeah. I yeah. thought, yeah. that's yeah. magic. It's like good skiers. They can get down the mountain right. on, any, on any piece of equipment, mostly, or good golfers can hit the ball. Mm -hmm. You can give Tiger mm -hmm. Woods, you know, a bad set of clubs, and I think he can still whack it. So, uh, your bands, how many? Your ensembles. Uh, oh, that's a good question. You know, I, I guess I have this reputation for leading a lot of different you groups. You do. And I, I, I do that because I think I, I'm always looking for a new way to say what I have to say. And so, you know, I have a brass group right now. and I, um, Called? Called Brass Ecstasy. Okay. And it's sort of a dedication to Lester Bowie, the great mm -hmm. trumpet player, mm -hmm. composer. Um, you know, I have a more or less standard quintet that I'm going to record with in a few weeks. And uh, I've been rearranging all these old church hymns for really? a modern jazz group. How and it's interesting. really interesting work. Mm -hmm. and, uh, like Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, or what kind of church hymns? Well, or I don't know that particular one, but Christian yeah, that's the idea. Or something like that. Yeah. So uh, the jazz part of you, where did you discover it? In a country, in, a, in New Orleans, in? Um, you know. I read Spain, I think, and that's why I'm well, asking yeah, the question. I, I was going to talk about Spain, I, but I, th I think like a lot of people in my generation, I heard more music on LPs sure. than most people had heard yes. in their lives up to yeah, that point. Yeah, back to the vinyl. Yeah, different kind, early jazz, modern jazz. So when I went to Spain, when I was 14, as a, a year abroad program, um, I ran into these young Spanish musicians who were playing jazz mm. and playing mm. sort of Art Blakey mm. and the Jazz Messengers mm -hmm. style, Thelonious Monk tunes. And you know, that's what I needed to learn too but they all assumed that since I was American that I must know everything right. that there is to do about it. So sure. I had a group and that's where I started performing and um, it's, it's very interesting in retrospect to think that I had to go away from my own country, mm -hmm. you know, where the Especially music was born, in. to go to Spain and, and be introduced to all of this. Yeah, all part tradition. of the journey, I guess. So did you first record for RCA or whom? My first recording was for a, um, an Italian label called Soul Note, mm. which has an enormous catalog of adventurous jazz right. from the 70s, 80s, 90s. And now you have your own label? And I, I did go to RCA for a number of years, and about 2004 we started Greenleaf Music, um, which has been my own label now and where I'm doing all my projects. How great. And two Grammy nominations? Yes. Next time a win. I'm, I'm, I'll okay. tell them you said that. And, well, um, yeah, you mention know, that. Do would you, you have influence with the committee? No, because I, that's oh, a problem. Well, but we'll talk. We'll then see why what did I, I can come do. here this time? I know no, Quincy. Quincy you Jones, do. yeah, if he sits on something. Quincy is wonderful. I know Pew. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> okay, you. Jump for Joy, Sunday, April 1st, Fay and Milton Wong Experimental Theater at SFU Woodward's Vancouver, Turning Point Ensemble, and you. That's right. Okay, how nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Thank too. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dave Douglas, trumpet player extraordinaire.